problem. Please, how can I help? I need to report a missing person. She's only 16. She's not come home. She's never gone missing before. She's just staying at her friends, you know, she's hiding. Maybe she's drunk a bit too much and she's sleeping it off. My Facebook blew up with her face, basically. It was everywhere. Well, I just remember wondering what's happened and what's going on. You know, the gut feeling was getting stronger and stronger that something serious had happened. This is something you see on the TV. This is something you read in papers. There was a huge search operation going on over many days involving dogs, air support and boots on the ground. And I knew then that that was my Louise. I knew she'd gone. In the Hampshire town of Havant sits the close-knit community of Lee Park. It's a nice, quiet area. It's nice living here, friendly. My neighbours are really nice, you know. It's a very, very cosy area to live in. I've lived here 47 years, Lee. People's all lovely. I enjoy the place, I really do. I say, and that's what made us move here, was the fact that it was safe and secure. There was very little crime. When things happen, the community does pull together and help the people out. So I think in a whole, Lee Park is a good place to live. Lee Park is also the home to popular 16-year-old Louise Smith. As a baby, like as a newborn, she was really just quite a quiet baby, to be honest. She used to sleep through the night regularly. She was just a, a really good little girl. Bradley, my brother, used to come and stay with me with her. And she'd just come in and say, can I play with your, your shoes, Auntie Haley? She'd go in my shoe cupboard, get all my shoes, and she'd clonk up and down the kitchen and in the, in the hall, and she loved it. She loved dressing up, you know? She was just so, oh, she was just a lovely little girl. Really good girl. And as she grew up and she began to toddle around, you know, she started to show a cheeky sense of humour. You know, sometimes I'd look at her and she just had a certain look in her eye. And I knew, I just knew she was going to come out with something. I just knew straight away. You know, and she was, she was quite a bright and happy child. As a young teenager, Louise enjoyed holidays and days out with her aunts and nan, and loved going to theme parks with family friend Sharon. Louise, honestly, she had adrenaline rush on the roller coasters, especially on the smaller Alton Towers. She'd come to Legoland, she'd come to Chesington, she loved Chesington, especially like the tigers and that. Louise was like my own daughter. We just really enjoyed each other's company. Louise's parents split and her father Bradley later moved to Scotland but maintained a close relationship. I used to have her every fortnight for a weekend. School holidays, half terms, I'd have her for a week. And one summer holiday, she stayed with me for five weeks, you know, because um, she just wanted to stay with me. And so, you know, whenever I could, she came up to visit. Um, we went to Edinburgh. She always wanted to see Greyfriars Bobby and touch, touch his nose, the statue for luck. By chance, when she came up, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival was on, and we walked around and saw it, and she, yeah, she loved it. I could have a, as much contact with her as I wanted. I was always allowed a good relationship with her, you know, without any problems. After school, Louise moved to a local college and studied veterinary care. She loved animals. There was no doubt about that. She absolutely loved animals. Like I said, we went to Chesington, and out of everything, it was the animal show she wanted to watch. She just wanted to do anything, I think, with animals. You know, and the, the world was her, was her oyster. I think her, her plans were just to get the course done and then decide what direction she was going to take with it. Being a typical teenager, it wasn't long before Louise's attention shifted towards other interests. Louise always had a boyfriend, always interested in boys. She's a very pretty girl, so there was no reason for her not to have a boyfriend. But some boyfriends wasn't the right sort of boyfriend for her. She went to college and I think she had a boyfriend and she struggled a bit and I think she just wanted to be with him a lot. 
She wasn't interested in anything else, you know, she just wanted to be with him. It's like, I'd rather talk to my boyfriend than my parents, you know what I mean? It was one of them. But certainly had, a, you know, had chats with her, the do's and don'ts. Not that she'd ever bloody listened to me, but, um, yeah. But in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit the UK. And a national lockdown meant that Louise would be spending more time isolated at her mum's house. Unable to see her new boyfriend, tensions started to grow at home, prompting Louise to pack a bag and move in with her cousin and her husband, Shane Mays, nearby. And to begin with, she seemed happy. But a few months later, everything changed. After Louise moved in Lee Park, she was regularly texting her friend, saying how they treated her like a child. Having had an argument, Louise left the home address on the 7th of May. She was contacted numerous times on her phone, I think over 50 times, and didn't respond. But at some point, Louise decided to go home and clear the air, and things were sort of getting back to normal. After making up with her cousin and Shane, the following morning, Louise makes plans for a special national holiday. On the 8th of May, which was actually Victory in Europe Day 2020, where there were lots of celebrations going in, in gardens, etc., in people's homes, that morning she woke up and she did a Snapchat around about midday saying that she's got, you know, a huge hangover, her head hurts as a result of drinking. It was established that Louise was going to meet her boyfriend at the skate park at around about 3 p.m. that afternoon. But we know that Louise didn't arrive at the skate park and that's when concerns were being raised by her boyfriend. Louise's cousin makes numerous attempts to call her mobile, but after an hour of phoning, the line disconnects. And by 6 p.m., Louise's cousin is left with no choice but to call 999. Some details would have been taken by the call taker at that point to establish how high risk Louise was and what were her vulnerabilities. Obviously, she was 16 years of age, so one would argue she's still a child and therefore vulnerable anyway. But we would also look at our records to see what we know about Louise. Some could say she was streetwise, only been missing three hours, not particularly alarming at that particular point, and there was no other information to suggest she would be high risk at that stage. With the case considered fairly low risk, Police don't arrive at Louise's cousin's address until 1 a.m. to write up a missing persons report. And those inquiries would be basic inquiries, speaking to friends and family where she may be hanging out. Shane explains to police that he accompanied Louise towards the skate park in Emsworth that afternoon before heading off in a different direction towards Tesco. Officers want to know if there could be any reason why Louise may have left of her own accord. So if it came out that she had had a falling out, then the police may take the view, well, she's sulking, she's just going to be staying with a friend or hanging around a park or something overnight, teaching them a bit, bit of a lesson to, to worry about, you know, and then she'll turn up safe and well in the morning. But the following morning, there are still no signs of Louise. I actually got a, a message saying Louise has gone missing, but lockdown was on and I technically was in a different country. I didn't know if I could travel. I was trying to arrange things. She'd never gone missing before. She'd obviously stayed at people's houses, but she always let people know where she was. I just thought, no, she hadn't. She's just a, it's drama. It was like, you know, I thought, no, perhaps she's just saying it, just to let everyone believe that she's gone missing. She's just staying at her friends, you know, she's hiding. Yet as friends and family try to reach out to Louise with no luck, concern sets in. It was completely out of character for her to disappear entirely, especially not be on her phone, because she was always on her phone. That was the scary thing. That was the thing that niggled in my mind, um, you know, and made me think, maybe something has happened, maybe something has happened, but I tried to block them thoughts out and think of it differently and go, no, she's, me she's just missing, she's going to turn up, because the alternative was just too upsetting. In the Hampshire suburb of Lee Park, concern is growing for 16-year-old Louise Smith, who was last seen heading towards a nearby skate park the previous afternoon, 
to meet her boyfriend. And with a missing person investigation underway, police attempt to paint a picture of Louise's life before she disappeared. I would describe Louise as a typical 16-year-old girl. She was going through that phase with her mother where she was starting to rebel a little bit. She wanted her own independence. They would regularly have arguments at home. She wanted to spend more time with her boyfriend. And you've got to remember, this was at a time uh, during the pandemic when lockdown was occurring. And so tensions were high in most households, I would suggest. Police also take into consideration what else was going on during the day Louise vanished. The day that Louise went missing was the 8th of May, which was VE Day, and that was being celebrated nationally. So there were lots of parties going on, but because this was locked down, the government restrictions at that time meant that you could only celebrate in your garden. But there was a huge party atmosphere going on within the community. And again, as a police officer, you're thinking, well, perhaps Louise has gone to one of these parties. Maybe she's drunk a bit too much and she's sleeping it off. If she's gone to friends and it is during lockdown, then potentially the friends might be thinking, well, I may have committed an offence here during lockdown and I don't want to tell the police that Louise is staying with me. So there's some additional difficulties at that particular time with that miss missing in-person inquiry. As the hours tick by, police dig deeper, questioning friends and family in the hope of finding clues into Louise's disappearance. Louise was 16 years of age. She's vulnerable by definition of her age anyway. We know that she'd had problems at home in the past. We know that she'd had mental health problems and also she was using alcohol. So all this uh, information coming in really ramps up our concerns and makes her a high risk missing person because of those vulnerabilities. And so her being out and not in contact with anyone is really concerning for me because she's a risk and not just to family members but you know other people out there could take advantage of her and as night turns to morning police issue an appeal to the public for sightings of louise when she didn't materialize the following day that's when the concerns were raised and so as you would normally do with a missing person inquiry, you would release details of Louise's image to the local media. You'd be asking for the public's help. You know, did you see Louise? You know, was she at one of these parties? So I'm on a lot of Facebook groups, uh, local Facebook groups around the area. And there was missing pages saying that, you know, have you seen this girl? But yeah, it was just my Facebook blew up with her face, basically. It was everywhere. When we found out Louise was missing, I said we was all worried about it. I just remember being there, uh, missing posters, being around, everyone wondering what's happened and what's going on. It certainly took off on social media and the community were doing all they can to try and find Louise by reposting the appeals that the police had put out. Police continue to focus their inquiries in the area where Louise was reportedly last seen, the Emsworth Skate Park. Officers would be tasked to survey the area, to see what CCTV cameras were in that area, going on the most obvious routes to take you to the skate park in Emsworth. We would capture that CCTV, which would be quite a time-consuming um, process, and then someone would have to review that footage. And while police scour the area for CCTV, the local community also gets involved in the search for Louise. A lot of people around Emsworth are looking for her, because obviously that was the the last place she was seen, that was their centre point and what I'm, I'm working out from there. The community seemed to come together to try and sort of help everybody to sort of get through the situation that we were in. There was people out all the time, um, in family and in, in the community of Leave Heart, there was loads of people out and about looking for her. You know, it was, it was a massive, massive hunt. There was lots of volunteers as well looking for her. I did go out in the car many of times looking for her. I remember once that I thought I'd see her and I jumped out the motor and I was hoping it was her, I think. And it, it did really look like her. Unfortunately, it wasn't her. But I just, I wanted to do all I could for Louise in the hope that I was going to find her. There was a hell of a lot of hope that Louise Smith was going to be found. Uh, safe and well. But as two days pass, there is still no signs of Louise. 
As the case got on during the lockdown, there was no more news. It started to get a bit more escalated and it definitely was an atmosphere in the local area. The gut feeling was getting stronger and stronger that something serious had happened. I think with any missing person inquiry, statistically, if someone isn't located within about 48 hours, the chances are they may not be alive. I think I just didn't allow myself to think like that because I just, the hope of her still, you know, of her turning up overrode everything out because that was my only concern. I just wanted my little girl to turn up. But it's when police look into the reason why Louise moved out of her mum's home at the start of lockdown, concern grows. She'd had an argument with her mum and she didn't like the, the boyfriend of the mum, who, who her mum used to call her stepdad. She didn't like him. She did not like him at all. So in the end, that's why she moved. That's why she moved out. Could this revelation be in any way connected to Louise's disappearance? But after making their inquiries, police are able to rule out Louise's stepdad from the investigation. Attention then turns to Louise's boyfriend, who was due to have met her the afternoon of her disappearance. We were told that Louise was intending to meet her boyfriend at the skate park in Emsworth um, at 3 p.m. that afternoon. Her boyfriend was a nice guy. I dated him in year nine for about a month. His little teenage little thing. Um, just when you're kids and we're just good friends and I see him sometimes around here. But Louise's boyfriend claims she never turned up as arranged. So where did Louise go? With Louise's phone still switched off, police retrieve cell phone data to try to track her whereabouts on the day she went missing to establish if she did walk to the skate park. So we would expect to look at the call data and the cell site analysis to, to show that that's where her phone is moving. But actually, what it did show was that it was moving in a completely different direction towards Haven Thicket. What a phone tells you is where the phone is. It doesn't necessarily tell you where the person is. So it could have been that Louise has lost her phone and someone's taken that phone and it's headed off in that direction. It could have been she'd, she'd been robbed and, and that phone's gone there. So always keeping an open mind. Six days into Louise's disappearance, there's a sudden breakthrough. Two people are arrested in Lee Park. I was just shocked. It was something I just thought, this is, this is something you see on the TV, this is something you read in papers, and I couldn't believe it. I was, I was just gobsmacked. Louise's cousin and her husband, Shane Mays, are taken in for questioning. Both were interviewed at length by detectives at local police stations, and Shane was adamant that he had done nothing wrong. As far as he was concerned, he walked with Louise the route that he said he walked towards the skate park, where she was then going to meet her boyfriend at 3 o'clock, and that was the last he saw of her. But for police investigating Shane's account, things don't add up. Having trawled hours of CCTV footage of the local area, there is no sign of Louise or Shane heading towards the skate park. An alarm bells start to ring in relation to Shane Mays. You start questioning, well, why is he lying? I think once you establish that perhaps some lies have been told to the police by people that were responsible for caring for Louise at that time, concern starts to raise. The latest evidence raises suspicion against Shane. But what led to his wife's arrest? I think when you look at the fact that she reported her missing only three hours after sort of a last sighting of Louise, because for me, a 16-year-old not coming home at 6 o'clock in the evening is not particularly something to be concerned about, particularly when it's not the parents raising the alarm. When you layer that with the other information that we're getting, it's starting to paint a picture that is one of concern. So having exhausted pretty much our inquiries based around the account that Shane had given us and also looking at Louise's phone data, it got to the point where we had made a decision that Shane hadn't been completely honest with us around Louise's movements and her disappearance. And so the decision was taken to arrest both of them on suspicion of kidnap.
In Havant, 16-year-old Louise Smith has been missing for six days after she failed to meet her boyfriend at a local skate park. Analysis of phone records and CCTV has failed to show signs of Louise going there, and investigations soon rule out her boyfriend. But police have arrested Louise's cousin and her husband, Shane Mays, on suspicion of her kidnap. So Shane Mays, I would describe, he was a 30-year-old man. He was out of work. Uh, his day consisted of pretty much getting up in the morning, going to the shops, returning home, and then spending uh, numerous hours on his computer, playing games. Didn't appear to be actively looking for work. Louise never said to me, oh, oh, oh I'm scared of him or anything like that. She never said that to me. She never told me that. With both Shane and his wife in custody, police conduct a search of their home for any sign of Louise. The police would have been looking for obvious evidence, but also it would have been a forensic search as well. So we would have seized all of their clothing that would have been worn on that day. We would have gone through any computers that were there. We would have taken phones as well to establish their movements, see if there were any other phones that we weren't aware of. Police find no evidence of Louise still in the house. So focus turns to Haven Thicket, since that was the last location of Louise's phone signal. What it allowed us to do was then focus all of our resources in that area to really flush out, you know, what clues were there and hopefully try and identify where Louise would be. And so there was a huge search operation going on over many days involving dogs, air support and boots on the ground looking for Louise or clues to establish where Louise may be. But also we could then move our media appeal to people that were using Haven Thicket on that day, VE celebration day where a lot of people, you know, would have been out getting their fresh air during lockdown and may have seen something suspicious. So we were really focusing on that area at that point. While the search for Louise intensifies, police have no concrete evidence to prove Shane or his wife had anything to do with her disappearance. A decision was taken to release them on bail, but with conditions that they reside elsewhere other than their home address and so they were placed in a local hotel near to their home address, which gave us the time and space to actually conduct our inquiries at their home address without interference from either party. You had a watch on 24 hours a day. There were 77 officers, vehicles surrounding the block. You had them knocking on doors in the general area, obviously trying to see if they could get any further information. The police had been working on a theory of kidnap. But 13 days after going missing, everything changed. Louise's body was found in the north of the thicket, covered up. Louise's body had been severely damaged, both by fire, but also by violence, we believe. Um, there was some attempt to cover up the body with sticks and wood. Clearly, a fire had been set. It was fairly obvious at that point that this wasn't an accident, this wasn't self-harm, but this was a murder. We're just approaching the area where Louise's body was found, and you can see it's hugely dense here. and You can't even see the footpath that we've just come off of, so you can only imagine what it would be like in the summer when you've got those really tall ferns around. So this is, this is the site where, sadly, Louise was found. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a fire that's, that's taking place here. I think that's what saddens me about this, is this is, it should be an area where kids can come and play and, and, you know, have fun and relax and feel safe. But this kind of beautiful location has, has really been tarred now with this horrific attack. With a body found, the crime scene is immediately locked down and preserved so the body can be formally identified and clues to a potential suspect can be uncovered. And a pathologist is called in. I was asked to attend at Haven't Thicket. It was very clear from quite a distance away that we were dealing with a severely burnt body. Thinking about the nature of the attack at the scene, 
it was simply obvious that there was some severe damage to the face. Now, that implied heavy impacts of some sort, and it was also clear that a stick had been inserted into the body. That's the sort of thing that could not possibly have happened accidentally. And so it was a question of identifying the particular stick and suggesting to the police how this might be managed. In this particular case, I said to them, I think what you need to do is to collect any DNA you can before anybody touches it. With the true horror of the crime unfolding, the police need to know who could be responsible for such a callous and brutal killing. As far as any more detail is concerned, there was really nothing much I could tell the police otherwise until we'd got on and got the body to the mortuary and uh, examined in more detail. And while Louise's remains are taken to the mortuary and DNA samples taken to the laboratory for examination, it isn't long before news reaches Louise's father while on his way to England to join the search. We was about halfway on the journey when I got the call um, to say they'd found a body. I was told, you can't tell anyone, you can't tell anyone. You know, nobody, not even your family, in case they say something, because it could jeopardise the case. It was a very anxious journey, because I just wanted to get here and, you know, see firsthand what was going on, what's, you know, what's happening. I had somebody message me that they had seen a black private ambulance come out of the thicket. I got in the motor. I drove down to the thicket. Obviously, we weren't allowed into the thicket. I had my friend in the car with me, and there was just police everywhere. And I knew then that that was my Louise. <laughs> I knew she'd gone. I remember it vividly, but I got the family round, because Bradley was coming down. He came in and told me in the kitchen, and I just broke down. I went, nah, it's not her. He went, hey, there has been a body found. I went, no, it's not her, it's not her. They got it wrong, it's not her. I just didn't think it would be. The news that everyone feared spreads across the tight-knit community. When I read the story on one of the local community pages saying that a body had been found, they couldn't reveal who it was, but parents of Louise had been told. And it was absolutely horrible. The outpouring of grief was huge within the community particularly on social media. There was a, a huge sense of upset and disbelief, and I guess despair, really, you know, and I think the same for the police. You know, I think you, when you're dealing with a missing person inquiry, you're always hoping that you're going to find that person safe and well. And then when I think when you do find a body, you know, it, it's, yeah, it just punches you in the guts, really. The hunt for Louisa's killer is now on. And firmly in the police's sights is one man, Shane Mays, the person who had been looking after Louise. What we found at about 10 past three that afternoon was an image of Shane Mays coming out of Cabinet Thicket and walking towards his mother's address, which is close by. Having said that, he was at the other end of the town near the skate park in Ensworth. The CCTV evidence places Shane near the scene of the crime. And when police receive forensic evidence, there's a breakthrough. Having carried out a number of examinations at both at the crime scene and also through post-mortem examination on Louise, and also the search that we did back at the Mays flat, we were able to establish that we had a DNA match from Shane Mays on a wooden stick that was found at the crime scene near Louise's body. But also, a, a speck of blood was also found on his trainers, which came back to Louise's DNA. Shane Mays is re-arrested, but this time he's charged with the murder of Louise Smith. His wife is also re-arrested on suspicion of assisting an offender. At a hearing, Shane Mays pleads not guilty to murder, which means a trial will ultimately take place. I'd say the pressure really starts at that point because you're then um, set fairly quickly a trial date 
uh, where you need to be trial ready. It's a painstaking process. You need to be 100% sure that that is the person that you say is the killer of your victim. After further investigations and without any evidence against Shane's wife, she is released without charge. With all evidence pointing to Shane Mays and a trial now set, the question everyone wants the answer to is why would Shane want to brutally murder a 16-year-old girl living in his care? Shane Mays has been charged with the murder of 16-year-old Louise Smith after DNA and CCTV evidence linked him to the crime. While police prepare a case for trial, Louise's family and friends have the agonizing task of saying goodbye to their loved one. The day of Louise's funeral, there was hundreds and hundreds of people People had gone out and put purple bows the night before her funeral on the lampposts. The community just all pulled together. It was lovely. You know, they all stood out on the streets and right from outside her house right up to the crematorium. Seeing everybody out there, it was, it was overwhelming for me personally, being a very private person as well. It was also quite wonderful just to know that they were there. And Lou would have been looking down, thinking, wow, I didn't realise I was so loved. And, you know, everyone was there. Everyone. Everyone. It was just... The world stopped. Just for a moment. Just for her. Six months after Louise's funeral, the trial is set to begin at Winchester Crown Court. But just as the court case begins, there's a surprising twist. Day one of the trial, his defence team entered a plea for guilty to manslaughter. So effectively, he was saying, I admit to killing Louise, um, but I didn't mean to do it. He basically then admitted that he had taken her to have a chat and everything because they'd had a falling out the night before, and that he basically just wanted to chat with her. They argued, she hit him with a stick, apparently, and then he attacked her, because he lost his temper. He just lost control. He said that he just, like, hit her and punched her in the face and did what he did to her, horrific things. And then he said he walked away and he heard her moaning. We examined that plea. We weren't happy with that. We were confident it was a murder. We were confident this was pre-planned. And so we, we stuck with our guns and said, no, this is a murder trial, and that's what we're going to be seeking for. As the prosecution presents its case, the jury has shown a Snapchat video showing Shane tickling Louise's feet while she was staying with him. Some of the things we heard in court was there was a lot of, um, you know, flirting going on between Shane Louise and you know she was still a child he should not have been interacted with her in the way that he was it wasn't appropriate at all but according to neighbors Shane had a more aggressive side the feeling of my wife and I being around Shane Mays was one that we didn't want to be around him Shane would be the sort of person I believe that would belt you for something if he thought you'd done something wrong running up the days to the incident because they were upstairs neighbours it was quite a lot of raised voices a lot of it was targeted at louise the court then hears how unhappy louise really was while living at shane mays when it came out in court that she was reaching out to other people that she hadn't spoken to me about it the only indication i ever got was one day she just said look i don't want to stay i don't want to be here at the moment dad i, I want to come up and see you and as i said lockdown stop that plan unfortunately so it was horrible it was an awful thing for me to deal with you know because i just felt like i'd let her down two days before louise's disappearance she phoned me and said she needed some lady products and i believe that that might have been a cry for help because she wasn't happy and unfortunately 
I blame myself that I let her down. And I do live with that, knowing maybe if I'd gone and took that to her, that she might have just opened up to me and told me. The court is shown CCTV of Louise and Shane walking together the day before her murder. The day before the incident, we actually saw them. Louise did actually say hello, um, but that was about all. She seemed very reserved. I think Shane was having a really bad influence on her uh, to sort of try not to speak to anybody, just focusing on getting back up to the, their flat. The prosecution reveals to the court horrific details from the post-mortem. In Louise's case, the whole central part of her face and both jaws had been broken into many pieces. The lower jaw in a couple of places and the upper jaw and the whole facial skeleton from the eyebrows down to the teeth broken into many pieces. Implication of that is that there have been some heavy blows from a heavy object. And the obvious thing in woodland would be a heavy branch of some sort, something of that kind. Large parts of the body had been burnt off. The upper limbs, the head, much of the chest, much of the belly wall at the sides especially, and to a certain extent at the front. The level of damage to Louise's body meant it was almost impossible to establish a cause of death. But the most shocking bit of information was yet to come. It was also clear that a stick had been inserted into the body something that was i was asked about specifically was whether or not louise was pregnant now there was nothing left at autopsy to say that she might have been pregnant the womb muscle itself was really quite well preserved the lining of the womb that gives you a better idea of whether she might have been pregnant or not all gone long since vanished so i couldn't say that but the reason that's important is someone might have tried to the assailant might have tried to disturb a pregnancy by putting a stick in there that, that suggestion was made after days of breaking down all their evidence to the courtroom the prosecution pieced together the full horror of what likely occurred during the last few hours of louise's life that morning, Louise woke up and she'd arranged to meet her boyfriend that afternoon at the skate park in Emsworth. So having seen her phone active around about midday, we know that uh, Louise and Shane Mays left the address around about one o'clock. But instead of heading in the direction towards the skate park, her phone signal moves towards Haven Thicket, revealing Louise's final movements on foot with her killer. How did Louise end up going to the thicket on foot with Shane Mays? There's no suggestion that she was forced there or dragged there. The thicket itself is huge, and there are so many areas you can go to where you could not see anyone else. That started to show that this was pre-planned and that he lured Louise to that location that was remote with the intention of possibly sexually assaulting her. At some point, Shane assaults and murders Louise and is seen on CCTV leaving the thicket at 3.30 p.m., heading towards his mum's house. Around 5 p.m., he arrives at Iceland supermarket in Lee Park. He went and bought some pizzas for both him, CJ and Louise, knowing that Louise was never going to be returning home to eat that pizza. By 6.30 p.m., Shane's wife calls the police, reporting Louise missing. Hello, police, how can I help? I need to report a missing person. She's only 16. She's not come home. But I think once the police became involved, I believe that he realised that at some stage we were probably going to locate Louise because her phone would show that she was in Havant Thicket. And so it's my belief that he returned to the crime scene at some stage, probably during nighttime hours, so that he wouldn't be seen. And he then built effectively a bonfire over Louise and set fire to her, possibly using an accelerant to destroy the evidence, knowing that it's highly unlikely that you'd get a dog walker or a pedestrian walking through the thicket during the night reporting a, a small fire taking place. 
he went back a couple of days after and finished her off. We're hoping that she died instantly so she wouldn't go through that pain. After a gruelling three-week trial at Winchester Crown Court, the jury returns its verdict. Shay Mays is found guilty of murder and is sentenced to 25 years in prison. I don't believe he should ever get out. I've always been the one that says, you take a life, you should do a life. I think capital punishment should be brought back. And I think they should lose their life, like they took a life, but not straight away. I truly believe if you're sentenced to, as he was, it's 25 years, that he should serve that 25 years, knowing for that 25 years, at the end of that 25 years, he's gonna die. Because that'll have to deal with him in his head all the time, psychological thing. And to me, that's a fitting punishment. With Shane Mays now behind bars, Louise's murder leaves a lasting mark on the local community. Now I reflect on it and I think, I wish I'd done this or I wished I'd done that, but obviously what's done is done. I can't do nothing about it. To think that something could happen on someone of her age, someone so young, dying of something so terrible, it, it makes you not want to walk the streets at night, especially as a female. It's never going to be the same in our little community here because of what's gone on. It's been wicked, really. There's definitely a dark cloud lingering, definitely a, um, a sense of mourning, I guess, of, of Louise. And every time I drive past the thicket now, I always look, look in. You just think to yourself, that's where it happened. I don't think I could ever go there, and I don't really see many people go there when I drive past to go to the local shop. It's really much of a barren, kind of left-alone area now. And two years since her passing, family and friends try to come to terms to life without Louise. The thing that sticks in my mind is the last minutes of her life. Was she scared? You know, she must have been scared. She must have been so scared. That's what really hurts me. I think she must be calling out for us and we couldn't get to her. People say um, time will heal. It doesn't. Time allows you to cope better. And I am starting to cope a bit better now, but I'm not there. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll be having a good time. I'll be having a right, great day. And then I feel guilty. Because I'm like, why, why should I be happy? Yeah, it's awful. And the whole family try to get on with it, but all of us think about her daily. Of course we do, of course we do. We miss her.